I want to welcome to the stage, not just a, somebody that doesn't really need a lot of introduction, but I think, you know, if you look at the whole sweep of uh, modern Washington State history, there are just not many other folks who have had such an impact on Washington State and who have represented Washington State to the rest of the country and indeed to the rest of the world. Uh, there, there are no other names that come to mind quite of the scale of former Governor Gary Locks. Let's welcome him to the stage. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you coming and doing this. I listed three things on there. I could have included uh, King County Executive, State Senator from 37th. Um, let, let me, yeah, I think right behind you there, hopefully. There you go. Um, I Sorry, was, I didn't jump on the stage. I was uh, uh, a, a campaign hack back in uh, 2000, and so I would be a little bit remiss if I didn't ask about Dylan and Emily, because every single stop you made back in those campaign days, we brought out pictures and talked about Dylan and Emily. How are the kids? Well, thanks to DJ for inviting me, but uh, I want to first uh, thank all the sponsors for making this uh, conference possible. I know we have a lot of divergent views uh, that will be represented uh, throughout the day, a lot of uh, elected officials and uh, uh, from local government as well as the state, so it's great to, to, that this uh, conference is uh, being held. Um, Emily uh, graduated from college this past uh, May. Mm -hmm. She's working for a small little consulting company uh, in downtown Seattle while she tries to save her money and hopes to become a, an actress someday. So um, I actually told her she should not take the job. <laughs> Uh, that she should just go off to, to Broadway and try her luck while she's st still got the enthusiasm, the daring, the courage, uh, because I'm afraid that in a couple years, after she saves a little bit of money, she'll be too cautious, uh, too practical. Uh, and, you know, kids should really just follow their passion now and, and not worry about the consequences later. Dylan is a junior at USC uh, in the School of Acting. Hmm. And uh, so I don't know where they got that theatrical bug. And uh, Dylan uh, and, and Madeline is just starting high school, Bellevue High School. So uh, the kids are doing well. That's great. Good. Um, I want to get. We, we have they a lot to get. They grow up way in. too fast. They grow up way too fast. I want to get into some of our, uh, of course, current politics and talk about the census a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I want to bring up this first slide. If you can put it back up on the screen, this is. Uh, you can see it here, Governor. Oh. Uh, this is the 1982 primary results when you ran for the 37th for the first time and won pretty handily. Uh, what were you thinking about, you know, when you're 32, 33, and you're like, I think I'm going to run for, I'm going to run for uh, uh, the legislature uh, as a young person, as a young man, uh, and you won. Those are solid numbers. Uh, what was that first campaign like, and what sort of compelled you to run in that first race? Well, actually, I was encouraged to run for office uh, for the state legislature two years before. I have to admit, I had never been to a Democratic Party meeting ever before in my life, did not even know much about the primary process or the, the role of committees and district committees and politics and anything like that. Um, and so, but I had worked in the state legislature as a legislative session employee, um, uh, as the attorney for the Higher Education Committee in the Senate and wrote the bill summaries uh, uh, of, uh, in those days they had a, a booklet that was printed out every day for the state senators before they went onto the floor uh, giving the background and the summary of the legislation they were about to vote on. So that gave me an incredible overview of all the different issues that the legislature dealt with and I came away so impressed by the everyday people uh, that were in government and I said, you know, maybe I could do that. And so I started exploring running. By then, someone else had already uh, filed, and they were running against uh, John O'Brien, who had been in the state legislature since the 1940s, um, and uh, the longest serving state legislator in American history. And um, someone had already filed, and oh, there's a filing period. Oh, I didn't even know about that. So. Uh, uh, I uh, waited two more years and uh, decided to try my luck. At that time, um, I, I decided to run against uh, a long-term Democratic incumbent. It's a solidly Democratic district. Traditional wisdom is that the incumbent is guaranteed 35 percentage points, even if he or she does virtually nothing, just by na virtue of name familiarity. And of course, Peggy Maxey being a, uh, a good voting Democrat, 
uh, had the support of all the interest groups from the teachers, the firefighters, realtors, you name it. And so um, we were kind of an underdog. There were three challengers to the Democratic incumbent, and so that means if we split the 65 percentage points evenly, uh, I'd get about 21, 22 percent of the vote. The incumbent gets 35 percent of the vote, and the rest would be history. Um, we had no money, and all I did was doorbell, 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 doorbell. And I ended up with, as this says, 51 percent of the vote. The incumbent ended up with only 30 percent of the vote, and the other two challengers got about 8 or 8 uh, percent. 8, 8%. So the rest is history. And the rest is history. Uh, it, is, it was notable to me as I was researching this that both John O'Brien, uh, who you mentioned, and, and Senator Fleming, uh, were on the ballot that year, both big names in Washington State uh, legislative political history. Then in 1993, you threw your name in the hat for King County Executive. Some folks may not believe it, but there was once somebody who was not a Democrat in the King County Executive's office. Uh, tell us about that 93 race. That was a, a colorful race, so to speak. A lot of, uh, some acrimony and, and uh, fill us in. Well, that was in the days in which um, um, we, uh, the top person in each party advanced to the final election. Uh, Tim Hill was running for uh, a third term. Um, and had eight years or four years before had narrowly won. Uh, Bruce Hillier had came close to beating Tim Hill, and so uh, Bruce Hillier decided that he was going to run again, uh, and really felt that no one, no one else among the Democratic side should be uh, in the primary. That uh, having almost won the election four years before, that he should have a clear path to uh, um, a rerun against Tim Hill. Um, uh, who had been a, a, a very effective Seattle City Council member years uh, before, but now was running for a third term as King County Executive. Um, and, um, but there were basically four Democrats running, uh, Bruce Hillier, uh, uh, King County Council member um, uh, Greg Nichols, uh, King County Council member Cynthia Sullivan, and, and then myself. Um, I had somewhat given myself an internal term limits in the state legislature. I'd been there for about 11 years, was planning on maybe running for one more term and that would have been it. And I was chairman of the budget writing committee. Uh, but I had always wanted to get into management because you can write all the policy you want in the legislature, but how it's implemented can make all the difference between success, failure, mediocrity. Uh, and so I really wanted to get a hand in execution of policy. Uh, and so I decided to run for a King County Executive. It was a hotly contested Democratic primary. In those days, the primary were in middle September. General election is in November. Uh, and whoever won the primary had less than two months, really, to raise all the money. And the TV stations wanted all the money in advance before they would uh, give you airtime. So you had to really raise that money. And really, uh, you only had three weeks, four weeks, in which to plan fundraisers. Um, so we came out of the Democratic primary, and all the Democrats spent all their money going into the primary. You, obviously, you don't want to lose a primary and say you had a bundle of money held in reserve, so you, you spend all your, your money just to win the primary. Tim Hill, being basically unopposed, had a huge war chest and had a huge advantage. Um, but again, we won that particular primary. It was a hotly contested primary, came out of the primary, and then ran against Tim Hill in the general election and, and won. It... Uh you know, before this year, this next slide, uh, before this year, well, let me first say this is the, the results from the 1996 primary, the gubernatorial primary. Down near the bottom, you'll see Norm Rice's name. Of course, I've singled your name out here in red uh, as having won that primary. You're also the, the last person to have beaten Jay Inslee at an election. Uh, you'll see his name second from the top there, uh, who, who was also in that Democratic primary. Um, what, what was that race like? I mean, I feel like, Gary Locke and Norm Rice were really big names on that election ballot uh, uh, and both very well respected. How, how does that 96 primary, what, what do you take from that now that we're 20 years past it? Well, that was a really interesting race because that's the year in which uh, Governor Mike Lowry suddenly announced that he was not going to run for re-election for a second term. Um, his campaign consultant, Bob Gogarty, was a very uh, close friend and a consultant for Norm Rice, and so I think um, maybe Norm had a little heads up that this that uh, Governor Lowry was leaning toward not running for re-election. Um, when that news hit, 
Uh, it came as a big surprise to a lot of people, and I was constantly being called by Democrats and Republicans saying, you ought to jump into the race, and I had just gotten married, and so I said, no, 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 I'm not interested. And I remember Mona calling me up, and I was touring the King County Jail, and she said, did you hear the news? I said, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, um, Mike's not running, and, and people are asking me what I am going to do. And I says, well, I'm telling you, I'm not running. I'm not interested. So she says, well, don't do that. Uh, to my surprise, she says, even if you're not going to run or we're not going to run, at least don't say anything so that you keep your name uh, out in the news, and that's good publicity. Uh, she was a journalist at the time and really had good media savvy. Uh, but a, a, several weeks later, after talking with a lot of friends and getting calls from Democrats and Republicans, we decided to run. It was a very fascinating race because there were basically 13 candidates running for governor on the Republican, mostly on the Republican side, and, and about five on the Democratic side. It was Jay Inslee, Nita Reinhart, a highly respected state senator, was in the race at that time, had already declared against Mike Lowry, Jay Inslee, and Nita Reinhart, even before his announcement. Uh, after um, Governor Lowry's announcement, Norm Rice jumped in, and then I uh, finally jumped in. On the Republican side, we had some great people. Uh, Norm Mailing, who was actually my first boss, uh, and technically my lawyer as King County Executive. He was the King County Prosecutor, Jim Waldo. We had Dale Foreman, head of the Republican Party. We had several state uh, senators, Pam Roach, um, um, uh, Ellen Craswell, uh, and a whole bunch of other people. And, um, um, and it was the highest Democrat versus the highest Republican. Uh, it was very awkward. Uh, running against Norm Rice because he and I were meeting every other week on city-county cooperation. We were both Democrats. I campaigned for Norm when he ran for mayor uh, and for the city council. Uh, Jay Inslee, uh, I helped him uh, campaign for him when he ran for Congress. Um, like I said, uh, Norm Mailing was technically my lawyer and, and one of my uh, previous bosses when I was in the King County Prosecutor's Office. So it was really, really hard. Um, and a lot of my Dear friends were on Norm Rice's staff, uh, so that was kind of awkward. The thing that I, I come away with uh, is a sense of pride in how the voters of the state of Washington voted. If you look at the results here, I got 23, 24% of the vote in the primary and being the highest Democrat advanced to the uh, general election. Ellen Craswell had 15% and therefore the highest among the Republicans, she advanced to the final November election. But Norm Rice had, according to this, 17.5%. So between Norm Rice and myself, we had 40, 41% of the total vote across the state of Washington. Two people of color having 41% of the total vote of the state of Washington. And that was a, a source of great pride uh, for me that the people of the state of Washington were willing to overlook and look beyond ethnicity um, and, uh, uh, in their votes. During your time as governor, we had this issue of, uh, it only really happened at, at one time in, in Washington state history, this $30 car tab issue. Just joking, obviously it seems to be recurring. Uh, some would say that, that uh, regardless of what happens with the challenge in the courts, that we should learn from uh, your time in office in the legislature then, uh, and uh, just the call a special session and institute $30 car tabs because that's the will of the people, just as happened during your term. Uh, there was a challenge in the courts and the special session convened. Do you think that's accurate, that history should be repeated in terms of legislative response or is this time and this question of $30 car tabs different from what you and the legislature faced? Uh, and, and should the courts be allowed to do whatever they're going to do on this? Well, I very much believe in, in the independence uh, of government and the three branches of government. And we have a checks and balance system, just as the governor can veto acts of the legislature and the legislature can override the actions of the governor or veto uh, by an override. Um, and, uh, and you also have the role of the courts. So I don't begrudge people for using the court system. I've never been upset when people sued me as governor. Uh, even some of my friends who are lawyers representing interests uh, suing me because I know, know, I know that that's their job. That's what our democratic system is about. When I was a prosecutor, some of my very best friends were the defenders. And the prosecutors and the defenders would you know, coach baseball teams together on the same teams, uh, parents in schools, um, but it was their job as a defender to represent the defendant, 
it was my job as a prosecutor to try to put the, put the person in jail. And sometimes I'd go into a court and the judge would rule against our side, but I would walk away feeling that justice had been done because the judge read our briefs, researched the law, and articulated a decision that seemed eminently reasonable. And so I, I could feel good about that. Um, I sometimes didn't like the fact that the judge ruled in our favor, but had, I thought, almost racist reasoning uh, and very discriminatory reasoning. And so <clears throat> you want, you know, we have this federalist system where you have the federal government, but you also allow for experimentation by the states. So I really believe in, in our republic, um, um, the, the quote that you had up uh, by Ben Franklin. I think our system is, is totally different because with the car tab situation now, you also have a lot of locally approved ballot measures that were authorized uh, under the law, uh, and a lot of that is being uh, thrown out. Um, and when we had the special session at the first car tab vote, um, it was only a state tax. There were no local options, and it only affected the state. Uh, and it affected state transportation uh, issues and measures and projects. Now you're talking about transit that have been projects and road projects that have been approved by the voters or by local governments. And they had that authority under the laws enacted by the state legislature. Um, I find it very ironic that uh, regardless of where you, you come out on the car tabs issue, I find it ironic that the people within the Sound Transit District, which was the real you know, uh, genesis uh, uh, for the outrage over the car tabs, uh, and, and, but the people within the three county system and within the district of Sound Transit, and people can complain all they want about uh, how the cars are being valued and you know, what type of uh, valuation, should it be blue book or should it be some other method of, of determining the value of the car. The people within that district voted to keep the car tabs. And yet the people outside the district in other parts of the state voted to take away the ability of sound transit people to have their tax. I mean, I find that really ironic. I mean, why are other people telling me what I, you know, deciding what I'm willing to do or uh, affect my ability? Uh, if I want to tax myself and I say yes to the tax, how can other people in another part of the state say, no, we don't care if you want to pay your own taxes or pay extra taxes. You don't have that authority. So uh, let, it, uh, let it be decided in the courts. Yeah. The, uh, I think it's notable on this next slide. I, I just have this up just because, as I say, it's notable that opening line, you're confirmed by unanimous consent. That doesn't happen very often anymore when uh, cabinet members are appointed. You mentioned earlier that there was a question about the IRS when you went through uh, your confirmation process. Yeah, it turns out when they did the background check and reviewed my taxes, I overpaid my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to fire my accountant. <laughs> and I love this photo. Uh, I wonder if you would tell oh. us about this photo and uh, why this created such a hullabaloo in China. Uh, this was taken the day uh, we were about to board uh, the plane to go to China as our family, uh, about to head off to China um, to assume the post of ambassadorship, taken at SeaTac Airport. And uh, I think the picture that, the, some of the other pictures that I've seen in the press have a slightly different view. It shows, clearly shows the back um, of myself and my uh, daughter, who's now entering high school, uh, Madeline. And we were buying a cup of coffee and getting a Starbucks order for the entire family as we were about to board the airplane. I don't know who took that picture. It went viral. The press in China got a hold of it, and the people on the internet, social media in China, saw that before we even landed. They were able to figure out what plane, uh, what flight we were on, because we had never announced uh, when we were arriving in China. And uh, we were met at the airport, coming down the escalator uh, by the press, uh, and they took pictures of us, not only this picture, but uh, us carrying uh, all of our luggage, the cat carrier, the dog carrier, uh, you name it. And uh, uh, what was unusual for the Chinese is that government officials don't ever go around buying their own coffee, let alone wear a backpack or carry a briefcase or hold an umbrella. It's all done by, by uh, staff. Uh, elaborate, uh, um, you know, they're really catered to. 
Uh, and we made a stir because here we are buying our own coffee, uh, carrying a backpack. Why am I carrying a backpack? For those of you with kids, that was Madeline's, Madeline's blankie was inside there, all right? You know that if you have a little favorite bunny or a blankie, if that ever gets lost, oh my gosh, life comes to a big end. Uh, and so I was the keeper of the blankie and the bunny. Uh, and uh, so, um, but uh, we, we, in China, we traveled economy class. Government regulation, most of the ambassadors of other countries also fly economy class. Um, not that we wanted to. I mean, even if I flew to, to back to DC, unless the flight is more than 14 hours, State Department says it's economy class. The flight from Beijing to DC is 13 and a half hours. <laughs> uh, so unless you're willing to pay for it out of your own pocket, uh, you fly economy class. But that was unusual. And so we got all this press in China saying, uh, you know, the ambassador is, um, you know, uh, they were talking about the contrast that we presented to the government officials. And after a while, that got to be a problem. Uh, around that time, uh, Vice President Biden came. Uh, and during his stop, uh, we arranged to have him stop at a noodle shop and to eat with the local people. Just cheap old noodles. Um, and that created a stir. And so the Chinese propaganda machine of the Communist Party, because they control the newspapers, came out with an editorial that said, this is all a American put on, uh, a show, artificial, um, and that uh, Ambassador Locke uh, should res resume, get back to being, uh, should get back to diplomacy uh, and quit showboating uh, because it's, this is really an American plot to destabilize the Chinese government. Uh, uh, you know, but the social internet was so supportive of what we were doing and creating this contrast. And, and pretty soon, uh, the Chinese leaders started requiring uh, or uh, sending out regulations, toning down official banquets, red carpet treatment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, when I left, uh, uh, the propaganda machine said, good riddance. Um, and, but then the social media reacted to that and uh, said, uh, no, uh, was very, very positive and very warm uh, to, to my tenure as ambassador. And then the, uh, the official news uh, site, uh, the editorial, quickly was deleted because of the backlash by the citizenry. So, um, but even when I met with the Chinese government officials, I was so warmly received um, and, and had more access to ch high-level Chinese government officials than any other ambassador even though the propaganda machine was trying to limit my exposure, and in fact, limiting the press coverage that I could get if we celebrated a US-China cooperative effort like in a hospital or medical research, uh, the Chinese press would tell us that they were ordered to make sure that the news coverage was uh, only so many inches, it could not be on the front page, or they could not even cover the event. They would come and, and listen to us, but they could not publish the story because they were under orders to minimize our exposure to the Chinese people. So we then used social media to highlight the, the great cooperation between the United States and China on so many different issues, whether it's medical research, education, culture, uh, the arts, and so forth. So how would you characterize the, uh, the Washington State-China relationship today within the context of the Trump administration's uh, trade uh, uh, negotiations and just the natural tension of strong global powers. Are we, uh, and, and maybe speak to that sort of multi-level nature of, of things that there's a government voice and then there's a voice of the people and sometimes those are aligned and sometimes they're different. Uh, put our current uh, relationship with China as a state in context of the last couple decades. Well, the First of all, the U.S.-China relationship up until most recently has increasingly grown stronger ever since the days of Nixon visiting China and President Carter reestablishing relations uh, with, uh, with China some uh, 40 years ago. Um, and we as a state heavily depend on that two-way trade with China. Uh, obviously, a lot of uh, things coming in from China, we see it at our Walmart and Home Depots and Targets and Nordstroms and things like that. Uh, but we, China is also our number one export destination from our farm agricultural products to Boeing airplanes to, to software, medical supplies, and you name it. You know, 75% of all Boeing airplanes are sold to foreign airlines. Almost 25% 
uh, or is it 50% goes to China? I can't remember. Uh, maybe I think it's 20, 25. 25. Uh, uh, that's uh, Norquid over from uh, Washington State China Relations Council. He's on your panel. He'll talk more about it. Um, so 25% of Boeing airplanes go to China. Uh, Wash China is our number one export destination for our Washington made goods and services. So a lot of jobs in Washington State depend on international trade and specifically to China. Uh, and the tariffs um, are hurting American households. We, uh, American companies, American policymakers have very serious and legitimate concerns, complaints about the economic and trade policies of China uh, in terms of in protection of intellectual property, forced transfer of technology. In order to do business in China, you oftentimes must have a Chinese partner. And if you have to have that Chinese partner, you have to share your technology. And after that partnership expires 10 or 15 years later, they now have your know-how and they can you know, uh, go off and, and, and operate without you. Uh, so many parts of their economy are closed to foreign participation, whereas in America, you know, we have Russian firms, Brazilian firms, Israeli firms, Chinese firms, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a lack of a level playing field in terms of, of foreign businesses there. So we have the very legitimate concerns, but I've never believed that tariffs was the right strategy because these tariffs are paid for by the American consumer. They're paid for by the American company. And even the New York Fed and the Wall Street Journal and others have said that the average American household is paying $1,000 more per year because of these tariffs. When you buy shoes at Nordstrom's or Target, you buy tools at Home Depot, uh, you buy stuff at Costco. So much of it is made in China, and the tariffs apply to those goods, and we, the American uh, uh, consumer and the American companies, are paying for it. So um, I would have, and many other people have, have talked about a totally different strategy that would have been equally more effective um, and without the burden and cost on the American consumer. So we need to, but at the same time, we need to keep pushing the, the great quality um, and high standards of American products, and especially from the state of Washington, are agriculture, agricultural products. Costco is doing gangbusters uh, with their first store that they've opened in Shanghai because American products stand for quality and purity, and in, they're in great demand uh, and highly valued in China and can really help the people of China as well as the leaders of China uh, achieve their goals of a higher quality of life. There are not a lot of folks who actively walk across the aisle these days, but on this point of tariffs and trade, you lead a coalition in support of President Trump's renegotiation of NAFTA, trying to move the, uh, the USMCA uh, through uh, to a vote in Congress. Um, you know, I, I, you've, you've been eloquent on the topic of, to uh, of tariffs. I wonder if politically uh, that is, do you find that that is a, um, I mean, are there interesting or unique lessons from that experience at leading this coalition uh, on the, the NAFTA renegotiation, given that it's Trump's renegotiation and therefore many Democrats just inherently don't like it? Uh, have we moved to a place where labor and, and uh, businesses are now more aligned on, on this question of international trade? Is this a relatively easy thing to get behind because of your experience being an advocate for a trade dependent state? How do you sort of place that USMCA leadership role within the context of your political uh, experience? Well, USMCA, US, uh, Mexico, Canada uh, trade agreement, it's really NAFTA, uh, revision of NAFTA, and I call it, and many of us like to call it NAFTA 2.0. It's a modification of the current NAFTA. It's an improvement of NAFTA, taking into account the shortcomings that have been identified over the last 25 years since the passage of NAFTA. It's also taking into account a lot of the new types of, of trade, the economy, a digital economy, e-commerce, and so forth, um, digital books, music, uh, software, games, and things like that. Um, and it's also to really help uh, create a little bit of, increase the, the decrease the incentives to outsource jobs, especially in the automotive manufacturing sector to Mexico. There's a requirement now that I think about 70% of automobiles must be produced in North America somewhere um, in order to avoid duties um, um, uh, when you purchase that automobile. Uh, and um, I think is it about 60 or 65% of the, of the 
automobile must be made in factories with at least $16 an hour in wages. So that will discourage outsourcing of, man of manufacturing jobs in the automotive sector to, to let's say, places like Mexico. Um, but it, it removes the barriers that Canada has imposed on our agricultural sector, especially the dairy sector, even Washington wines, where, for instance, in British Columbia, American wines uh, cannot be prominently displayed on the shelves. So there's so many good benefits for, for um, American workers, American uh, 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 manufacturing, as well as um, our agricultural sector. So it was an easy, easy decision to support this. As much as I disagree with President Trump on just about anything and everything he does, I l you have to look at the merits of the issue. And we cannot be so blinded into saying, well, because someone supports this, I cannot support it. Let's look at the issue itself. Um, and what's ironic about this is that many of the provisions of this NAFTA 2.0 are provisions taken straight out of President Obama's TPP proposal. I mean, it's, it's just slapping on the TPP provisions on so many elements of trade and putting it on to this revision of, of uh, NAFTA 2.0. Same thing with the, the U.S.-Japan uh, trade agreement uh, that's been uh, proposed. It's really just taking chapters out of the TPP um, that President Trump uh, 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 disavowed and, and rejected, and, and yet his trade people are using those very chapters and, and sentences uh, from uh, TPP to put onto these new trade agreements. One of the interesting things of this last election in, in 2019 was this question of affirmative action. It was interesting for a number of reasons. One was because it was confusing. Initiative 200 from the 90s banned affirmative action. Uh, Initiative 1000 in the legislature overturned that. Referendum 88 sent that question to the voters. <laughs> Uh, but I thought it was interesting that a, a group of Chinese Americans so prominently arose on the scene to, uh, to, to move this question to the, the ballot box and ultimately were successful in retaining the initiative 200 intent of repealing re affirmative action in Washington State. Um, that was confusing for, uh, I guess, maybe a number of uh, folks who assume people of color are going to be more progressive in Washington state. Uh, most of those people are white who don't maybe know any better, maybe have good intentions, but uh, missed it. How would you explain uh, sort of the cultural politics of that experience? Uh, the, the Chinese American uh, for, uh, force that arose on our 2019 ballot within the context of uh, uh, longstanding engagement by the Chinese American community in Washington state. Well, first of all, I, I was really glad to see engagement of, of parts of the Asian American community, especially the Chinese American community, that have traditionally not been very active in politics. As much as I took was on the other side, I thought it was actually great that, that we're seeing more political involvement by people of color. And I, I think we need that all across uh, uh, our, our nation. And I very much support more people of color and Asian Americans running for office, even if they're running as a Republican. I mean, it's you know, let's, let's build up our base and our numbers first, and, and we can talk about policy and viewpoints later. Um, uh, I think it's, it's part of a, a growing movement within the United States among especially uh, Chinese Americans and especially parents uh, who were born in China and with their kids here who are concerned about what they view, view and, and I'm not going to say I agree with them, but what they view as quotas or limits on the admissions of Chinese American students to places like Harvard and other prestigious institutions. And then some of the policy debates going on within New York City about uh, programs, uh, enrichment programs and, and programs, gifted programs, and whether or not uh, uh, there are enough uh, 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 African American students who are admitted into those programs and whether they should be more proportionate to uh, uh, to the population, et cetera, et cetera. And if you have that type of, of requirement of proportionality, are you getting away from merit-based? Is there therefore a quota or a limit on the number of Chinese or Asians that are admitted to these programs? And so um, uh, when, when the initiative effort was launched in the state of Washington to um, um, repeal some of the anti-affirmative action policies passed some 20 years ago in the state, uh, then, then um, that effort uh, was therefore ripe uh, for opposition and uh, attention 
uh, by uh, this group of uh, uh, Chinese Americans nationwide, and then they helped uh, uh, galvanize a part of the a Chinese American community who really led the opposition to what the legislature did. That's why the legislature was so, I think, reluctant to take on this issue because the polling showed that it was very confusing and people down deep uh, do not like elements of affirmative action or what they thought was affirmative action uh, and did not want to want to change it. Uh, once the legislature passed it, uh, this group of Chinese Americans uh, 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 mounted a successful petition drive, signature gathering, to now put it back on the ballot to let the voters decide. Um, and um, and uh, so uh, it was a short campaign after that, and uh, one of the closest referendums uh, in, uh, or ballot measures in state history, I think uh, it was uh, the, the uh, vote to undo what the legislature did which was to undo what, uh, what happened 20 years ago in terms of limiting affirmative action. I think the uh, um, undoing what the legislature did was 50.5%, uh, and the vote to keep what the legislature did was 495 or 49.6%, so it was a very, very close uh, election. What's uh, ironic, though, is that the, the, the King County, where you have more Chinese Americans and Asian Americans, overwhelmingly voted to, to keep what the legislature did in terms of modifying the affirmative action uh, prohibitions of 20 years ago. But it was the rest of the state where we have a very small or almost non-existent Asian American population, predominantly white, that uh, decided to, to keep the policies banning affirmative action uh, of 20 years ago. Which is, which is also ironic because that's it's almost the same phenomenon you saw with the car tabs initiative. Uh, the people who are most affected by the car tabs, sound transit, the high taxes for sound transit, voted to keep those taxes, but it was the rest of the state, not affected by the sound transit tax, who voted to eliminate the sound transit tax, even though they're, they're not paying it at all. Many people in the room have, have taken Political Science 101, <laughs> and so, uh, like myself, and so therefore I'm sure I know everything there is to know or that I need to know about the census and how it works. Last time we had a census, you were running the shop at uh, Secretary of Commerce, at least for, for most of that time. Um, what do we need to know that we think we know, but we don't? What do we need to know about this next census uh, that we collectively need to be aware of and mindful of? Well, this is, first of all, this is something that's been with us ever since the United States was formed, going back to George Washington. And the number of basic questions on this 2020 census is very similar to the questions of that very first census in 1790. Uh, the only questions we don't ask now are uh, that they asked back in 1790 uh, were, how many slaves do you own? That's basically, uh, that's the only difference. Um, and. Um, uh, so, um, the thing that you'll need to know about this census is that it is controversial. Uh, the Commerce Department is woefully understaffed and underfunded in this effort. Maybe part of it is my fault because we were so successful in the 2010 census. Uh, it was when we came into office and when President Obama came into office, the 2010 census, a, a year out from his taking office, uh, a year out from when I became Secretary of Commerce, was identified by all the government watchdog agencies, the Congressional Budget Office, General Accounting Offices, Inspector Generals, um, that it was the most troubled technology project facing the Obama administration, and that uh, they were predicting an abysmal failure. Uh, and I was told by the White House that I had to uh, keep the crap from hitting the White House, that I was going to take I was going to take the hit for it, and I had to. Uh, assume the responsibility for it. But in my confirmation hearings, or meetings, with past Republican and Democratic census directors, they said, it's a mess. Uh, first of all, most people don't respond to mail back surveys anymore, and that's how we uh, answer this, the census, you mail it back in. And people were not responding, uh, whether you know, buy a car, you had you know, your refrigerator service, they send you the surveys, you know, how was it? People don't respond, it goes into the re recycling bin. Um, and then you have a problem of overcounts and undercounts. And then we had the left and the right calling for boycotts uh, of the census. 
uh, the Latino community was saying, don't participate in the census until we get full immigration reform. Well, we were saying, hey, you know, that's not in your economic or political self-interest to boycott the census. And we had the right Michelle Bachman saying, don't do this. Um, and so we ended up using uh, public service announcements with Democrats and Republicans jointly uh, uh, doing a uh, public service announcement. Carl Rove under the Bush administration and Howard Dean doing a joint commercial together saying it's your constitutional responsibility to do this. Um, and um, uh, we brought the, we had the most successful census in some 30, 40 years, the most accurate census in about 30, 40 years, and we brought it in at 20% under budget with a $2 billion savings. Um, and, uh, but now this is a very troubled census because they're not prepared, they're very far behind, and they're going to have to keep up. The, the importance of, the, the significance of the census is that the census drives federal dollars and to some extent state dollars to communities. Uh, $2,300 per person goes out to communities based on the census. And so if a community is undercounted, whether it's a small town in the state of Washington or Seattle or eastern Washington, a rural town, $2,300 per person is at stake. And so if there's a significant undercount, your community will not get the dollars it deserves from the federal government or the state for highway programs, road programs, senior housing, nutrition programs, um, uh, Head Start programs, early education programs, and the list goes on and on. Uh, housing programs, homeless programs, the list goes on and on. So if you care about making sure you get your fair share of federal dollars, you need to participate in the census. And the, th the second thing is that it determines the drawing of political boundaries. You know, we have, what, six million people in the state of Washington. We have only 49 legislative districts. So you divide 49 into the total population of the state, and that's how many people there will be in every legislative district. We have so many congressional districts. We will divide that number of congressional districts into the total population of the state, and that's how many people will be in each legislative or congressional district. If there's an undercount, then you may not get the political representation you deserve. Uh, you may have to be merged in with people from a different community, and uh, you may not have as many seats in Congress uh, that we might, we might gain an extra seat in Congress if our population has grown significantly. Some states will lose a seat in Congress because let's say there's more people living in Texas than there are in Indiana or Iowa or, or, um, or South Dakota or Montana. Uh, and so if you want that political empowerment, if you want your voices and concerns addressed in the Congress, you want to make sure that you, got, you get your fair share of political power. Uh, there is, there's a lot of controversy over the census, and I, I, I'm going to take, bring this up. There's a big debate, uh, there was a big debate that the Bush, uh, Trump administration wanted to count, they wanted to know how many citizens there are in the United States, and that there should be a citizenship question on the census. Well, first of all, uh, it's been proven in the courts and testimony and, and depositions and memos that have been revealed that it was politically motivated. Um, and um, by asking a citizenship question, it would discourage certain populations from answering it for fear that maybe there would be a follow-up and they'd be found out to be here illegally and they would be deported. Uh, and if you suppress and diminish the number of people responding to the census, then maybe the urban areas would be undercounted and they would not, in some of the urban states, would not get as many members of Congress and it would benefit the rural states and they would get more members of Congress uh, at the expense of maybe taking some seats from California or Washington or New York, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, so finally the court said you can't ask that question. Now people say, well, we need that information. Well, the census, Bureau does collect citizenship information by using different surveys. So it wasn't necessary to have it in the 2020 census, the citizenship question, because the Commerce Department through the Census Bureau gets at that number in other ways uh, through other types of sampling. But for those of you who are political junkies, here is the real issue. Um, there are some people in America who feel that the members of Congress should be determined 
or in allocating the number of seats, let's say, uh, we have what, uh, how many seats do we have? In, we have 10. In deciding whether we should have 10 seats in Congress, or nine, or eight, or 11, should it be based on the total population of the state of Washington, citizen or non-citizen, or should it be based only on the number of citizens? So if it's based only on the number of citizens, maybe the population of the state of Washington drops by 100,000, or no, by citizens. Not legal or illegal, but just pure citizens. Maybe our population drops by 300,000, I have no idea. And maybe instead of having 10 members of Congress, we now only have nine. And therefore, some of the big states with a lot of immigrants, even legal immigrants, California, New York, Florida, people have been, who have lived here for maybe 20, 30 years, even if you're a Canadian citizen working here in the state of Washington but never decided to become a U.S. citizen, or let's say you've been here for 20 years and a lot of Asian Americans here for 20, 30 years, never bothered to become a United States citizen. If they're not counted in deciding how we allocate the number of seats in Congress, we therefore could lose seats in Congress. All right? Now here's the next question. There's some in the United States who say, not only should it be a citizen, but the seats in Congress should be allocated based on voting age citizens. So if you have a city or a state with a lot of children under 18, if they're not counted for the, or if they're not used in the total of determining how many seats in Congress we have, the state of Washington might only get eight seats in Congress compared to other states where you have not many young people, but mostly adults. Now, that type of distribution of seats in Congress based on citizenship, legal or illegal, based on the voting age, will have to be decided by the Congress because they determine the qualifications and how we allocate seats but there's nothing to stop states from using this information and deciding how they will allocate their seats to their state legislatures. Mm -hmm. If we in the state of Washington were to allocate seats based on citizenship and voting age, certainly Seattle, Kent, Auburn, Tacoma, Bellevue would be at a disadvantage compared to the population in eastern Washington. So these are very fundamental questions, and that's why there was, a, you know, the, the inclusion of the citizenship question was much more far-ranging than many people thought. Well, I, I knew that we would be able to talk about the census. I knew that we would be able to talk about China, Washington State political history, that you've had a number of titles over your career. I didn't know your, your titles included the keeper of the bunny in the blanket. So I appreciate uh, you being with us, Governor Locke. Thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Governor. Yeah. If I could. Um, sure. Yeah. I, I know we have a, a lot of legislators that are, that are here now and, and uh, that will be coming throughout the day. Uh, I, I welcome this gathering and, and applaud this gathering of, of uh, viewpoints. Uh, I know that on the agenda are some of those who are on the opposite side on the affirmative action uh, debate. Uh, I'm glad that they're here just to participate and to uh, uh, express their views. We really need more forums for policy discussion in a nonpartisan, in a non-rancorous uh, fashion, in a more civil, uh, in a more civil manner, and that's what concerns me. Um, you know, you asked why I supported USMCA. I, you, we have to start looking at the issues, independent of who supports it, who's uh, putting it, putting those 
uh, proposals forward. I remember when I was in the state legislature, oftentimes a Republican, and it was time when the Democrats controlled the House and the Senate, and a Republican would offer an amendment, and the knee-jerk reaction by all the members on the floor was, well, because it's offered by Republican, we have to vote against it. And I'd look at it, and I said, wait a second, this, this amendment makes absolutely good sense. I'm going to stand up and say I support it. Yeah. Um, and we need to start looking at things in an independent, nonpartisan fashion, because highways, local government, you know, schools, Job creation, do not have a Democrat versus Republican label, and I oftentimes think that those labels get in the way of real progress. But we also need to start thinking beyond just today, and that's what I'm concerned about in terms of American politics and even in our state. We're so focused on the issues of today, we're not planning for the future. Yeah. Uh, just this past... Uh, uh, I, I want to interject. Yeah. See that clock? Yeah, I see that. It says that. we're eight right. minutes past uh, time. Well, well, we'll cut back on the coffee. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> just, just this past Sunday, uh, Governor Evans, Slade Gorton, and I and others were speaking at a memorial service for Jim Ellis. How many people are here uh, from Washington State who were here in the 60s? All right, we have a few people here. In 1968, Jim Ellis <clears throat> um, put together a ballot measure called Forward Thrust. Jim Ellis was the one who conceived of the idea of the metro sewage treatment plants in the late 1950s when Lake Washington was closed off due to massive pollution. So he put together this ballot proposition that said that we will create this government entity to collect raw sewage from all around Lake Washington, have it treated in sewage treatment plants, purified, and then emptied into Puget Sound. Until then, Every city, every community dumped their raw sewage into Lake Washington. He was labeled a communist at that time for coming up with this proposal. Nonetheless, it passed. And then in the 60s, in the late 60s, he and a group of civic leaders put together a ballot proposition that created the Kingdom, Seattle Aquarium, uh, all the swimming pools of King County. The, they were called Fort Thrust Swimming Pools in every community parks like Marymore Park, Discovery Park, Gasworks Park, uh, Luther Burbank Park, the Freeway Park, fire stations throughout the county, a lot of sewer and storm uh, projects, money for the homeless, and a subway system. The subway system was rejected by the voters because we needed a super majority, a 60% vote at the time, even though it passed by a majority. Atlanta got that money. 80% federal funding, 20% local funding, and we don't have a subway system. Atlanta has our subway system, and we rejected the homeless proposition. But all these other propositions passed. In today's dollars, it would have been $5 billion of taxes collected from the voters. And they have voted it, yes, back in 1968. All right. The 1970s, he created Farmland Preservation of King County. The 1980s, the Convention Center. The 1990s, he was behind the preservation of forest lands all the way along I-90 from eastern Washington to um, the shores of Elliott Bay. He was thinking of the future. What do we want our community to look like 20, 30, 40 years from now, and what do we need to do now to ensure that we ha th th those, uh, those uh, systems are in place, from farmland preservation to swimming pools to fire stations uh, to uh, parks and things like that. We don't do that enough today in our politics. There is technology that's going to be very disruptive just around the corner. And we're all concerned about homelessness, and we're all concerned about uh, uh, income inequality. But technology is going to really transform our economy and will bring very disruptive effects. McKinsey estimates that by the year 2030, that's 10 years from now, 5 to 10 percent of the world's workforce will be displaced due to AI and robotics. Now, that's 5 to 10 percent of the entire world's workforce. That's not going to affect the workforce in Myanmar, Burma, or Vietnam, or the Congo. It's going to be in the industrialized countries, whether it's China, Korea, Japan, the EU, United States. So does that mean that in, the, in our country, it might be more like 8 to 15 percent? 8 to 15 percent of the workforce without a job 10 years from now. We're already seeing how AI is uh, 
affecting our economy. We don't have as many lawyers doing research. We won't, you don't have as many people in the medical field interpreting uh, x-rays and MRIs. Pharmacies, it's being affected. Financial institutions, you, we don't need as many people doing that. It's all done with AI in terms of who's worthy of a loan. The list goes on and on and on. We won't have as many truck drivers. We won't have as many delivery people. We won't have as many people in Starbucks. You now have an Amazon Go store where you walk in, pick up something, walk out without ever paying and talking to anybody. I can imagine 10 years from now walking into a Starbucks, they'll say, AI will say, good morning, Gary. Do you want your usual of a um, tall mocha with whip? All right, extra hot, and you walk out, you don't even have to pay for it, and it's waiting for you there. I mean, there's not even a barista taking care of it. So what are we doing in terms of all these jobs that are going to be gone in 10 years? Are we, to gonna wait, are we going to wait until 10 years to figure out the solution? You know, we wait until people are unemployed to give them unemployment benefits. Do we need to change our unemployment system to say maybe it's a, a health services account, flexible service account, between the public and the private sector to draw upon that for job training and retraining now before that dislocation occurs? Because what's going to happen 10 years from now is that we're going to have candidates from the left or the right demagoguing this issue and promising a return to the glory days of yesteryear. Vote for me and I will make life great again for you or the way that you remembered it five or 10 years ago. Yeah. And that's the, the challenge for policymakers, public and private, nonprofit, think tanks, journalists, oh, many of the organizations here, because you're all gonna be affected by it. We're all gonna be affected by it. Our kids are gonna be affected by it. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. And let me say, thank you.